Hello Bio20, this lesson is going to be on energy in the ecosystem. We're going to start by reviewing a couple of things from previous science courses, a couple of the laws of thermodynamics dealing with energy, and also taking a look at uh, food chains and food webs, and then getting into what are called ecological pyramids. So just a reminder, as you see here, the first two laws of thermodynamics. First one, as you've seen and heard before, energy cannot be created, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be transformed or converted from one energy form to another energy form. The second law of thermodynamics deals with efficiency, and what it says is that whenever there is an energy conversion, it will, chances are, not be 100% efficient, and where that energy goes is in the form of heat. So whenever there is an energy conversion, there is, as we say, a loss of usable energy or energy that is available to do work. The rest of that energy, it can't be lost, it cannot be destroyed, but it can be released in another form, and that is typically in the form of heat. So when we talk about the word entropy, that is dealing with disorder, and when we do have reactions that are taking place, the overall entropy is going to increase, and much of that increase is due to the production of heat. So we'll take a look at a very, very simple example here of a food chain. So with the food chain, what we have is energy that is being passed from the producers. In most cases, those producers are going to be photosynthetic organisms, plants, the algae, and it'll also include what are called chemosynthesizers, ones that don't rely upon energy from the sun, but they get their energy from chemicals, and from those chemicals, they're going to generate the energy that they require for cellular processes. Those producers in, producers in turn are then going to pass the energy up through the food chain. So when I say up through the food chain, we use arrows to represent the movement of energy through the food chain. So the tip of the arrow, very, very important, that arrow does show the direction that energy is traveling. So as we can see here, the energy is going from the producers being passed on to the next stage in the food chain, which is the primary consumers, then on to the secondary and the tertiary consumers. There can be some other levels as well, but as we'll see, most food chains only have two, three, four different levels, and very rarely do we see five or six levels in the food chain. When we do have that energy passed on, it's in fact a fairly small percentage of the energy that is passed on from one level in the food chain to the next level. And that amount of energy that is passed on is really only about 10%. So at each point here from the producers to the primary consumers, primary to the secondary consumers, and the secondary to the tertiary consumers, only about 10% out of the 100, of course, is passed on to the next energy level. So what happens to the remainder of it? Well, the majority of it, 90%, is not passed on, but it is released in the form of heat. So that again is at each stage here where we do have the arrows, 90% is going to be released in the form of heat. Now this is an average, there is a range, and the range is usually somewhere between 5% and 20%, but it is 10% that we usually use for the energy that is passed on. So sometimes it is referred to as the rule of 10. So when you see that term, the rule of 10, it is referring to the 10% of the energy from one level in the food chain that's passed on to the next level. So right now I've just been using the term levels, but these are actually referred to as the trophic levels. So the producers are what we refer to as trophic level number one. Primary consumers would then be trophic level number two. Secondary consumers, number three. And according to the picture here, the tertiary consumers would then be trophic level number four. Just keep in mind as well, uh, we do have the producers. All of the other ones are the consumers. And we can also talk about different levels of consumers and some other terms as well. So when we do talk about the primary consumers, You've probably heard before the term herbivores. Herbivores are primary consumers. They are the ones that are consuming the producers. 
the other ones above the primary consumers, the secondary and the tertiary consumers, those ones are going to be the carnivores. Now, because we do have energy that's lost at each point along the way, a huge amount of energy that's lost at each point along the way, that, of course, means that there is going to be less useful energy that is passed on to each successive trophic level. And that's going to be significant when we do get to talking about these different kinds of ecological pyramids. So we would expect from this to have a fewer number of consumers higher up the food chain, higher up the trophic level than what we would have producers. And again, this is the reason why we do have a limit to the number of trophic levels. Eventually, there's just not enough energy to be passed on to support another trophic level. So the three different ecological pyramids that we're going to be taking a look at, they are referred to as the pyramid of numbers, the pyramid of biomass, and the pyramid of energy. So they can be drawn in, well, the shape of a pyramid. And with the pyramid, the important thing to keep in mind is that the base of the pyramid, this is the largest portion, and that's where we are going to find the producers. So producers are at the base of the pyramid, and with any of these ecological pyramids, whether it is the numbers, the biomass, or the energy, it makes up the base of the pyramid, and that should be the largest portion of the pyramid. As we go higher up, we have the other trophic levels. So the next one would then be the second trophic level or the primary consumers. These producers, again, keep in mind that is the first trophic level. And as this picture that I've drawn here, this pyramid, I do have only three energy levels or three different uh, pyramid levels, three different trophic levels. So this first one here, the pyramid of numbers, it is simply taking a look at a given area, a sample area of an ecosystem, and physically counting the number that you do have of individuals for each one of the different trophic levels. So in the given area, whatever it is, whether it's a square meter, a hectare, or a square kilometer, we're counting the individuals, all of the individual producers, all of the individual primary consumers, the secondary consumers, and so on for every single one of those trophic levels. So as we do go higher up in the trophic levels, what we would expect to see is that there are fewer and fewer organisms, fewer and fewer individuals that at the lower trophic levels. And again, this has to do with the fact that not as much energy is available to those higher trophic levels. Now, there are some problems with taking a look at the pyramid of numbers, a couple of them that I identify here. And again, we have another pyramid with uh, some actual species in here for the different trophic levels. So this doesn't show the pyramid shape, but it's a very similar representation. Here we have four different trophic levels, one, two, three, and four. So if we start with the base of this pyramid, we're using as the example here the grasses, individual grass plants, individual blades of grass, I guess, if you will, they have 1.5 million. So as we go up to the primary consumers, the mice, we see that there are much fewer, 200,000. The third trophic level, the secondary consumers, the snakes in this case, 90,000. And that will support, in this particular ecosystem, one single hawk. So hopefully this kind of gives an explanation as to why we only have four trophic levels. If you only have one hawk in this ecosystem, that's not just, uh, that's just simply not going to be able to support a higher trophic level. So a couple of the weaknesses, and you should be aware of what these weaknesses are, it does ignore the difference in the size. So in this example here, individual blades of grass, yes, they are going to be much, much smaller than the mice, but we could also have some herbivores, some primary consumers that in fact are much, much smaller than the producer, much, much smaller than the plant. So an example that we'll take a look at on the next slide here, what we will have are insects that are consuming trees. So in this case, the tree would be much, much larger and there would be fewer trees relative to the number of insects that are feeding on them. And again, that's the example that I give here. Perhaps 1,000 aphids is probably many, many more than that feeding on a single tree. Another drawback of the pyramid of numbers 
is that some organisms, they can also occupy more than one position. They can occupy two, and in some cases, maybe even three positions on the pyramid. So classic example here, a bear uh, does eat uh, plants, so it is a herbivore, but it's also an omnivore. It is going to be a carnivore as well. So it's going to occupy at least two different levels in the um, food chain, in the trophic levels, and in this particular pyramid. So we can have, in some instances, what is called an inverted pyramid, and this is the example that I was referring, referring to, where we do have a fewer number here of producers than what we have the primary consumers, and that is simply due to the size. So again, that's one of the drawbacks of this first pyramid here, and as we can see, we no longer have that kind of classic or typical pyramid shape. The next pyramid is called the Pyramid of Biomass, and let's just kind of jump down to the picture here for starters. This one's a lot nicer. Again, we do have sort of the classic pyramid shape, but you'll notice that examples for each one of the trophic levels, we don't just have one single organism or one single species. In fact, we have several different producers. We have several different primary, secondary, and even tertiary consumers here. So if we take a look at a food chain, compared to a food web, a food chain would only be talking about one single producer eaten by one single second or primary consumer, one single secondary consumer, and so on. It's much more complicated. So if we do take a look at all of these different producers that we have here, all of those may be consumed by the moose. Not only are they consumed by the moose, they might be consumed by these other species as well. So when we talk about a web compared to a food chain, we have many individuals, many species, many populations occupying each one of the different trophic levels. But this one is kind of nice, and if we do take a look at what we have in each one of the boxes, it's kind of small here, but what it shows is the mass in grams per meter squared. So not now we're not taking a look at the number of individuals, but we're taking a look at the overall mass of all of the producers in that particular sample area. All of the primary consumers, all of the secondary and tertiary consumers in that particular area. So this a little bit more difficult to do. So in this case, what you do need to do is to collect all of the producers. So that includes the trees, the bushes, the grasses, what you see above the ground, the stems, the leaves, the trunks of the trees, and you also need to take what you find below the ground, all of the roots. You need to dry them out, and you need to take the total biomass of them. Not only do you need to do this with the plants, but you need to do it with all of the animals that we find at the different trophic levels. So as with the pyramid of numbers, what we would expect to see with the pyramid of biomass is there would again be less of, well, something. In this case, it's not less or fewer numbers, but it's less biomass that we find at the higher trophic levels compared to the lower tro trophic levels. And again, this illustrates for us the decrease in energy that is available at each one of the successive trophic levels. Still a problem with this, and one of the problems is mass per mass. Animal tissue does contain more energy, more joules per gram, more calories per kilogram, however you want to phrase it, more energy than does uh, the plant material. So there's about 20% more energy that you would find in animal material, material than what you find in plant material. So that is one of the weaknesses associated with the pyramid of biomass. The last one that I'll talk about here is the pyramid of energy. And as it says here, this one is really the best. It is the most accurate representation because we're taking a look directly at the amount of energy. This one a little bit more challenging as well. So here we need to actually use what is called a calorimeter to measure the amount of energy present in a sample from each one of the different trophic levels. So we might take one kilogram of producers, and what you're going to do is you're going to dry it and you're going to burn it. When it burns, it's going to release energy. That energy is in the form of heat, and you're going to measure how much of that heat was released 
that amount of heat that was released is the amount of energy that was present in that one kilogram sample of producers that you have. Then you're going to do the same thing with the other trophic levels. You're going to relate that to the size of the ecosystem that you're taking a look at. And you're going to again generate an ecological pyramid. So this one here, same thing with our primary producers, our consumers, primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers. Now if we take a look at what we have in the box here, we do have the units of joules, which are the units for energy. If we go from the first to the second trophic level, if we take a look at these nice even numbers that we have here, we have in the second trophic level, the primary consumers, 1,000 joules. That is exactly one-tenth of the energy for what we have in the primary producers. So as we talked about that rule of 10, that does mean that 10% of the energy is then passed on from the producers to the next trophic level. What about the rest of it? 90% is released in the form of heat. Exactly the same as we go from the second trophic level to the third trophic level, 10% passed on, 90% lost in the form of heat. And the last trophic level shown here as well, 10% passed on. So nice even numbers that we're taking a look at, but that is important for you to kind of keep in mind and remember that this is referred to as, once again, the rule of 10. The rule of 10. The energy in the sunlight isn't really part of a food chain or a food web, but it is kind of interesting that they stuck it in here. And what that shows is that the primary producers, when they do capture the solar energy coming from the sun, this in fact is even less efficient. So it's typically on the order of like about 1% to 2% or even less than that, the amount of energy available in the sun that is captured by the producers and converted into chemical energy in the producers. A little bit of a twist with this uh, last example here. Even when we do take a look at the pyramid of energy, sometimes there are a couple of, well, possible problems. So the picture that you do have on your handout, it shows only two levels. There would be more levels here in this ecological pyramid, but it only shows two of them. What it shows are whales, and these whales, what they're going to be consuming are crustaceans, tiny little organisms, marine organisms that these whales are going to be feeding on. You can think of them as tiny, tiny little shrimp, in some cases microscopic shrimp that they're going to be feeding on. So if we do take a look at this pyramid, it is an inverted pyramid, so there is something wrong with it. And what is wrong with it is really all we need to do is not just take a look at the energy in the whales, the energy in the crustaceans at one single point in time, at one single day for a given volume of water, but we need to take a look at it over a longer period of time. So if we do take a look at it over the period of a year, what we will find is that the total energy in those crustaceans is in fact going to be much, much, much greater, well, about 10 times greater than the energy that you would find in whales. And this is due to the fact that crustaceans, they do have a very, very short lifetime, and they are reproducing continuously, whereas whales live for decades and decades. When we talk about these microscopic crustaceans, they may only live for a few days, but they are continuously replacing that population due to the very, very rapid rate of reproduction.